So welcome everybody to MesosCon 2015. Um, as David said, I, I um, am the Apache Mesos VP, the PMC chair of the project. Um, so this is kind of like the chair's report, I suppose. This is me giving a report of, of, of where the project is today. So uh, I just kind of wanted to start with MesosCon 2015. We have about 700 plus registered attendees. It's amazing to see all you out here. Um, it's up from 262 in 2014, so we're really growing as a community and that's, that's really great to see. Uh, as David just mentioned, please don't miss the EMP event um, later tonight. It should be a lot of fun. I wanted to give a big shout out to all our sponsors, in particular our platinum sponsors, Intel, Cisco, and Mesosphere. Our gold sponsors, Basho, Project, Project Calico, Redapt, um, Twitter, Two Sigma, Verizon Labs, and VMware. As well as to SignalFX for putting on a great hackathon yesterday at Moz. That was, that was fantastic. Thanks for, uh, thanks for doing that. And then, uh, of course, thanks to all our speakers. The keynote speakers that have already gone this morning, the talks were fantastic, and for the other keynotes that we're gonna get tomorrow and the, the day after that. Um, and just the, the rest of the speakers, we have over 20 companies represented here today um, speaking about Mesos and the Mesos ecosystem, so that's, that's really, really great to see. Okay, um, one last little bit of ad, ad, administrivia as well. Uh, we're doing MesosCon Europe, so that's gonna be October 8th and 9th in Dublin. Uh, I think it'll probably be a single day, single track. I think um, Dave, Dave Lester's still working that out. Um, uh, the CFP closes next week, so please, we're looking for more great speakers and sponsors, and I'm personally gonna attend, so um, I'll, I'll see you there. It should be a lot of fun. Okay, so, um, without further ado, what is the current state of, of Mesos? So I think I, I kinda, I'll start, I wanna dive in and really talk about the user community and, and where the user community is today. So, you know, um, we got a bunch of new users. Now, the way that I collected the new users and just kind of took a few of them to show was I just ran this git diff command uh, and specifically looked at our Powered by Mesos page. So if you're an organization, and Dave's gonna love that I'm saying this, if you're an organization that's, that's, that's not on the Powered by Mesos page and you wanna be there, great. We had about, I think, 25 new companies added in the last year to the Powered by Mesos page, and I just collected a small sampling of some of the ones that I think a lot of you would, would, would have heard of or maybe even used or worked with. Also, I learned this cool, I don't know if you guys know this, but you can do git diff head, you can actually type one year ago, like 10 days ago. It's pretty cool. For those of you that didn't know that, now you know that's really, really rad. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, we had a ton of new frameworks built. Uh, I originally had packed them all in one slide and I had to break it up into two slides. So there's been a ton of new frameworks built. Um, Elasticsearch is a framework. Kibana as a framework. A lot of you probably just saw Basho talk yesterday about React as a framework on top of Mesos. Crate.io, um, Kafka, um, in fact, I think probably tomorrow during Joe Stein's talk, you might hear a bit about Kafka as a framework. Logstash, MySQL, there's also a talk on, on MySQL a little bit, um, I think that's tomorrow. Um, in fact, we have even, even more frameworks. Uh, Apache Myriad, which is running Yarn on top of Mesos. Um, Swarm, for those of you that went to DockerCon, probably saw the, the, the demo of Swarm running on top of Mesos. There's also a talk about that uh, later today. MemSQL, Kubernetes, Hadoop, uh, HDFS, and Cassandra. So a ton of new frameworks that are actually being built on top. Um, and that's, it's fantastic to see that growth. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about how really our goal as the Mesos community is to make that uh, be, uh, make those frameworks be as, as successful as possible. Okay. Um, there's also been a bunch of new solutions. Uh, uh, companies have, have created, created Mesos-based solutions. The two I kind of wanted to call out here is Capgemini and Cisco Cloud, um, which is great. Okay, there's been a bunch of new integrations. Um, I'm just calling out a couple here. The two I kind of pulled out was uh, uh, the Mesos console integration that the Cisco folks did, um, as well as the Project Calico, uh, uh, the Project Calico integration. There's actually gonna be a talk about that later today as well. Um, talk's called Mesos Networking. It's at, at 4.50 p.m., not a.m. Some of you are probably up that early, the East Coasters. Okay. Uh, you know, there's even new books, which is, which is fantastic. This is why I get to pick on David Greenberg for a second. David's writing a book, which is awesome. It's building applications on Mesos. And Roger, as well, is writing a book. He's somewhere in the audience, um, and he's gonna be talking as well about uh, uh, using Mesos with, with Puppet. So it's great to see these, these books being created. Okay, so that's kind of a little snapshot of what's happening in the user community. 
And now I kind of want to dive into what's actually happening in the developer community. That's not to say that the folks that are writing frameworks on top of Mesos is not considered our developer community, but it's you know, more in the, the user space of actually leveraging Mesos. Okay, so developer community. So you know, we've had a ton of new, new contributors and new committers over the past year. Um, you know, we had 78 contributors in total since last year. So across from last year's MesosCon to this year's MesosCon, I just collected these stats from, from, from GitHub. We've had 78 contributors, which is really fantastic. I'm great to see that. In just the last release, we had 50, 52 contributors. That, that was the 023 release, which came out about a month ago. And in the last two months, we've added three new committers. Um, so it, it, it's a tough process to actually become a committer to any Apache project, definitely the Apache Mesos project, so it's fantastic to see these new, new committers being, being added in the, last, uh, in, in, in the last two months. Okay, um, the developer community has been driving a ton of releases. Um, we, uh, we were doing about a release every three months or so with some, some patch releases in between. Uh, the most recent release was 023 that we did last month. Um, uh, July 17th is when that actually came out. And since then, the developer community has actually decided to move to a different release cadence. We've now moved to a monthly release cadence for minor versions. So whereas before we had about a three to four month uh, period in between our releases, we're now doing monthly, which actually means that the last one, 023, came out on, on, on July 17th, and just on Monday of this week, Vinod Kone cut um, the, the uh, 024 RC1. So that's actually out for voting. It's got a bunch of great new features in it. And we're going to be doing uh, minor patch releases now every month. So we're going to have a train. We're going to have a lot, a lot more releases. So that's, that's actually really exciting. There's been a lot of people that are excited about getting those features more frequently rather than waiting three to four months at a time. OK. Um, so I kind of wanted to dive in and actually talk about some of the noteworthy features that have been in the, these past couple of releases over the past year. And I'm not going to be able to talk about all the features, but I really wanted to, to, to highlight some of the ones that I thought were, were pretty impressive that were be, being built by the community. So one of the first ones that I wanted to mention was, was modules. So this is basically where, where we were able to, with the Mesos community, create a plug-in system so that anybody, whether it be integrators, operators, uh, uh, tools writers, whatever it is, could go and actually inject some of their own code into how things happen in a Mesos cluster. So, um, you know, we've actually, uh, over the course of the last year, we've, we've created three different types of module um, uh, that, that you can write. The first is kind of these replacement modules where you can actually change the allocator in the system. You can add new isolators in the system. You can do things that are, that are actually changing the, uh, the, the implementations of how, how Mesos will actually do particular things, whether it be in the master or the, uh, the agent processes on all, all the nodes. We also added this, this different kind of module system that we call the hooks module. And with hooks, you can actually inject yourself uh, directly in the path of certain parts of the code base. Rather than having to build an entire new implementation where you might be copying a bunch of stuff, you can actually just do things directly in the code base. So I forgot to mention um, the replacement style uh, modules we've actually used to do a bunch of really, really interesting work, um, uh, some of which is some work around oversubscription that I'm actually going to talk about in a few slides. The hooks module we've actually used to do a bunch of really interesting networking integration, which, as I mentioned earlier, is going to be talked about later today at 4:50 uh, p.m. 4:50 p.m. And the last kind of module is what we call the um, uh, the anonymous module, which basically lets you inject any kind of arbitrary code you want to run. It'll kind of run in its own thread in uh, the Mesos masters or in, in any of the other components. So this is just if you want to run some code in the process because maybe you have some benefit of doing that, you can actually do that. Okay. The cool thing about these things is you can enable them at runtime, and you can pass them module-specific parameters. So you can bring up a Mesos master, you can plug in your modules, you can pass it its own pr parameters, and then, and then it can just run. There's a great talk later today at a, a 4 p.m., a talk's called Mesos Gets Pluggable, Introducing Mesos Modules. So uh, anyone that, that, that's interested in actually being able to take advantage of that, I, I recommend that you go check it out. Okay. One of the next noteworthy features I really wanted to talk about was introducing more security into the system. So in particular, we added SSL. So you know, some folks are probably thinking, well, that's not a big deal. <laughs> you just added SSL. If you're using, say, a Java library, maybe you just like flipped a little configuration thing, and then you got SSL. Um, well, it, it's a, it was a bit, bit more challenging in the C++ environment. And uh, I think one of the things that was actually really, really cool that we did here um, was we made it so that pre-SSL pre clusters could talk to SSL, to, to, to SSL components. 
um, and we actually go through through, uh, through, an, through, through, through through an upgrade, which basically means, which is a really important part for anybody that's actually running large Mesos clusters in production, that you don't need to bring everything down and then bring up your cluster as SSL. You can just bring down certain components, roll those into an SSL world, and then bring down the other components and everything can just keep running. So that's pretty awesome. And there's gonna be a talk on that as well uh, uh, today, this morning, um, shortly, called Securing Your Mesos Cluster. So for those of you that are interested in that, I, I recommend you check out that. They'll talk about more than SSL as well. They're gonna talk about authentication, authorization, some of the other pieces of, of, of security. Okay, um, you know, one of the next ones that I wanna talk about, which, which I think is really, really great, is uh, uh, network isolation. So um, for those of you that, that, that know the details around Mesos, there's many different ways in which we can containerize apps. One is what we call just the Mesos containerizer, which was the default way that we were actually doing containerization before Docker, before, before uh, 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 Rocket, before other, other uh, technologies were, that got, got existed that, that actually do, did any kind of containerization. And one of the things that we built into our, what we call our native containerizer, or the, the Mesos containerizer, is this ability to do network isolation um, where you can give every single uh, 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 container its own network namespace without, without using NAT. So you know, most people are really afraid about giving, uh, doing any kind of bridge networking or NAT-based uh, uh, network isolation because it, it can be extremely slow. Um, but we, we actually built something that's really cool where you effectively do port-based uh, mappings and port-based isolation, but we can still get the bandwidth capping and flow control and the network stats that we really want. Um, and it's very, very efficient. So there's gonna be a talk about that as well uh, at 4.50 p.m. today. Uh, it's called Per Container Network Monitoring and Isolation in Mesos. And uh, again, if you're interested in that, I, 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 I highly recommend that you go check it out. Um, kind of around the containerization space, one of the exciting things is we're gonna be able to start using a lot of the, the containerization uh, 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 techniques and systems that we built in the past with things like your Docker containers as well. So we'll be able to take this kind of networking isolation and use it directly with Docker images or, or, or your, your, your Docker containers. That's ongoing work, but that's, that's really exciting to see that grow and expand. Okay. This is a really fun one. So um, we built in, to, we built in um, an oversubscription mechanism uh, uh, directly in Mesos. So what is oversubscription? What's this all about? What was the goal of this? Um, well, if you were to look at your data center at any point in time, you could kind of break up the resources and how they're being consumed into a couple of different chunks, right? You can say, okay, I've got, you know, the reservation, the, the, sorry, the, the total capacity of resources, and of that total capacity, some amount of them are actually reserved for, for, for certain jobs to actually be able to run their things. Of the reserved jobs, uh, resources, some of those resources are actually allocated. Of the allocated resources, when the tasks are actually running, only so much of those resources are actually used. So this is a pretty typical thing, right? You go to launch your task, you believe your task needs four CPUs and four gigabytes of RAM, and your task en ends up using one CPU and one gigabyte of RAM, right? It was one of the typical things that happened in a lot of virtual machines, and it can happen yet again in a Mesos-based cluster as well. So what can we do about that? So what we actually built in was, in, in was a mechanism where we can detect that slack resources, what, what we call the usage slack, and we can reallocate that slack resources out as what we call revocable resources, so best effort tasks can actually take advantage of those resources, okay? Um, you know, but beyond, beyond the technology just being really, really cool, I think one of the things that, that really impressed me about this project was it was, it was a, a couple companies that came together to work on this. It was Twitter, it was Intel, and Mesosphere. Um, they built up a, a, a great design doc, got a ton of community feedback, and actually went from the architecture and the design doc to code committed in, in a, a, a running version that uh, you're gonna see a demo of later today in about two months. So it was really, really fantastic to see the community come together and actually actually do those pieces. So as I mentioned, at 12.45 p.m. today, there's gonna be a demo of this um, uh, uh, during the, the Intel lunch keynote. Um, and I think if you wanna see a demo as well at the Intel booth, you can go, you can go check it out there. So that, 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 that was a really great project to see done. Okay, so rather than kind of talking about a whole bunch of other features, I'm gonna talk about a few more. Um, but I wanted to give kind of a quick perspective of sort of, you know, great, great, we're building a bunch of these features, but where's the project going and what's the project really trying to focus on as we move forward? And I think, you know, to, to, to do that, I, I wanted to, to, to bring it back to when we were first building Mesos, 
um, when we were at Berkeley, we were really looking at trying to create uh, this, kind of, this evolution of cluster management. We looked at a lot of cluster management. Of course, we had to write a, a research paper, which meant we had to compare why our cluster manager was better than the countless cluster managers that had come in the past, uh, and what we were doing that was actually different and provided some, some new value or some novelty. And really what that was for us, it was this evolution from the speci a specification-based cluster manager where you just kind of write down your declarative spec and you say, now go run this, and then you kind of say hands off and you take a step back into this two-level model where software that's actually running on top of, of the cluster manager could communicate in this back and forth way when it came to resource allocation, deallocation, whatever kind of communication needed to happen. And you know, one of the reasons why we specifically wanted to do this was because we wanted to provide these primitives in this, through this two-level communication channel that would let distributed systems that people were writing on top to be, able to, to be able to do smarter things and ultimately to be able to manage themselves. I think it, it took a while for me to really understand, even though I said it in talks, what it really meant to manage themselves. But I got a couple of slides that I think really captures it a, a bit more effectively for me. So, you know, the, the way I really think about it is this, and, and I saw this all the time when, when I was at Twitter, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen it in other organizations as well. In the data center, you kind of really do have, have in companies and organizations, you kind of really do have two different kinds of developers. You have uh, the guys that wrote the code, the, 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 the folks that wrote the code, um, uh, uh, you know, and I'll call them, I, I suppose, the, they, the developers, you know, just for, for, for a term. They, they, they're building the first distributed system, right? Um, and then you have the operators who are actually operating these distributed systems, but more likely than not, they're writing a bunch of code too, <laughs> right? Because they end up having to write a bunch of code to actually manage running these distributed systems in production. They write code that says, oh, well, when this thing fails, I know I want to do this other thing, or if this event happens, I want to deal with this. What's so interesting about this is that, you know, a lot of the distributed systems that end up being built are so complicated that we get whole books out of them. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, MySQL high availability, like specifically how you can run MySQL in a high available way. In most organizations, these end up looking like the run books, right? This is, this is the run book of the organization about how you can actually run this thing. And, you know, the, the, the perspective that we took with this two-level model in Mesos is that distributed systems should be able to manage themselves. All these new frameworks that we were talking about should be able to have the mechanisms to work with Mesos to be able to manage itself. So they can deal with the failures, they can deal with events, they can deal with, with whatever's happening. Okay? And that's really, that's really the value and opportunity that we have in the Mesos community is to really provide the best primitives and provide the best abstractions for building and running these, running these new distributed systems so they can manage themselves. And I, you know, the, the last presentation from Neha was, was really fantastic. I love that, that she talked about pushing complexity down, but maybe not all the complexity, just the complexity that everybody's actually also re-implementing. And those are the primitives, right? Those are the abstractions. We don't have to push all the complexity. We don't have to build all the things. We can find the right things that we're trying to build, and we can build those into things like Mesos that then frameworks and distributed systems on top can actually take advantage of. So with that in mind, I just kind of wanted to talk about a couple of the other things that we've done recently and some of the ongoing work um, and how all those pieces fit together. So the biggest one is, you know, of course, if we're going to, if, we're go if we want, it, if we want this, 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 these, these primitives and these abstractions to be, to be leveraged by people, we need to have a great API that people can actually use to consume those things. And so what we've done recently is we've created our, our first V1 API. So um, we're moving into a versioned world with our API. So we've created a V1 API, and we've moved completely to a sane HCP transport format that any off-the-shelf Python or Go uh, 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 or Java or Scala or whatever HTTP library can actually consume. So no more dependency on libmesos, for those of you that know, know what, that, what that means, um, which is fantastic, yeah. So, you know, and, and this is actually going to enable, enable us to build new primitives faster, more primitives faster. Um, it's a big prerequisite to our 1.0 release, uh, and it's also the beginning of a rename in the entire code base from the word slave to the, name, to the name agent. So I'm not gonna dwell on this too much, but it's the right thing to do for the community, so we're moving from the word slave to agent, and if you go look at the V1 API today, you'll actually see that anywhere where you used to see the term slave, um, um, the term agent will be there. So for those of you that have written a bunch of scripts that are assuming the word slave exists in the code base, we're gonna go through a whole deprecation cycle. It'll probably be two or later until that stuff's completely removed, so we're not gonna break you, but we will ultimately be moving to, to, to the new name. 
So the, 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 there's a great talk at, uh, uh, at 11.50 a.m. this morning from um, Vinod Kone and, and Isabel, uh, and they're going to be talking about the new Mesos HTTP API. So that's great. Okay. Um, another one of these, these features, these, these primitives that we wanted to introduce that would make it easier to build distributed systems on top, especially stateful distributed systems, was dynamic reservations. So we built this in. Um, the goal here is to basically let a task be able to get sticky resources. So if the task happened to fail or the machine happened to fail, whatever it was, it could get those resources back, right? So we built that in as, as a, a primitive called dynamic reservations. And again, uh, there's a great talk that's going to be today at, at 2.50 called Supporting Stateful Services on Mesos Using Persistence Primitives. Um, this is a key ingredient for really enabling those storage-based frameworks that, 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 um, that we want folks to be, that folks are building and we want more folks to be able to build. Uh, and related, we introduced a concept called persistent volumes. So this can let you get data that happens to be written in a volume on a physical machine or you know, on a machine that you can get re-access to, again, after tasks might fail, containers might fail, or uh, machines get, get rebooted. Again, it's a key ingredient. It's also going to be talked about, about in that, that 2.50 p.m. talk. Um, and just I kind of wanted to give a quick shout out for a couple other great stateful services uh, talks that are happening today. I mentioned one earlier, um, the Apache Cotton Talk, which is a uh, MySQL on Mesos. And actually, one of the things as well, since Mesos is an Apache project and uh, um, we're big fans of the Apache community, uh, one of the things that's been great is a couple of the projects that have been frameworks on top of Mesos, we've actually brought back into the Apache community as incubator projects. So the MySQL on, on Mesos work that the, the Twitter guys did, we actually brought that into the Apache incubator. It's called Apache Cotton, as well as the Myriad work, which was the Yarn on Mesos. We also brought that, brought that back into the incubator. So it's great to see new frameworks being built and then, and then also being, being plugged into the, the ecosystem. Okay, um, so a couple more that I think are really, really interesting, and there's also some, some talks about them, so I wanted to mention. So one is Quota. Um, so Quota is really starting to introduce a, a lot more constraints around how we want to get resources scheduled in the, the data center. And it's a really key ingredient for folks that are trying to run multi-framework, especially multi-framework at scale. So we've seen this in a, in a, a, a bunch of, of um, uh, organizations that are, are actually running this stuff at scale. Um, and this is work in progress, but we're making a ton of work. Like the oversubscription work, it was a bunch of people coming together, creating a great design doc, a, a bunch of good feedback, and, and we're on their way. So there's a lightning talk about that today at uh, 1.25. Uh, the maintenance primitives is the other work that I really wanted to call out. And this is one of the most interesting ones because it really, to me, highlights the strength of this two-level model. So the maintenance primitives, what we're able to do in a normal Mesos world when resources get allocated through a mechanism that we call the resource offer, and you get the resources, then you decide what you might want to do with them. What we're introducing is effectively a deallocation as well. So we're also being able to say to these distributed systems that are running on top, hey, I need these resources back, either because the machine's going down for reboots or for maintenance or other events that might actually be happening. So it's a really, really good way of capturing the strength of the two-level model. Um, uh, there's going to be a talk, talk on that at, at, at 2.20 tomorrow, um, and uh, uh, that, is, that also, while it's a work in progress, uh, there's working code there, and folks that are interested in starting to play with that, um, come, come find, find, find Mesos developers, and, and they can uh, uh, get you access to that stuff. Okay, so um, I'll just take a little bit more time. Uh, you know, one of the goals that, uh, that we have uh, uh, with Mesos community is to grow the community. And um, one of the ways in which I'm excited about talking about growing the community today um, is with the introduction of the Microsoft Windows community. So um, this is really, really fun. Uh, uh, the Microsoft guys have been working with us to actually run um, uh, Mesos directly on Windows. And um, uh, Windows, uh, Windows plus Mesos makes a ton of sense. There's a bunch of organizations that just have a whole bunch of applications that they're trying to run. They don't want to manage launching those on individual machines. They still just want to treat all the machines in the data center as a big pool of resources where they want to launch applications. If they happen to be running on Windows, that's great. If they happen to be running on Linux, that's great. So I actually, we actually prepared a fun little demo. Um, before I get to that, a couple of quick fun, fun things about the, the Mesos on Windows work. Um, one is, is that what we're getting out of it actually is a new build system as well, which is super nerdy, but it's really, really fun. Um, uh, so for those of you that aren't fans of Auto Tools or AutoMake, we're actually getting CMake out of this, which is really fantastic. Um, uh, we're actually porting some, some internal things to make it run di di directly on Windows. 
Um, and to start, we're just doing process-based isolation. Uh, eventually, we'll do Docker-based isolation. We'll probably even do uh, native Windows can container isolation as well. So a big shout out here to Alex Klemmer, who's been our, our direct contact at, 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 at Microsoft for making this all work. Yeah. So here's, here's the fun demo I'm, I'm gonna run. I, I think this is great. So, so um, we're gonna run a couple of mixed work, workloads. We're gonna use Marathon um, uh, to launch the tasks. This gets scheduled through Mesos. And what we've done is we've launched a Linux box and we've launched a, a, a Windows box. And we're first gonna launch the Windows task. Uh, hopefully it'll get scheduled on the Windows box. Um, then we're gonna launch a Linux task. We're gonna see the Windows uh, task actually talk to the Linux task. Then we're gonna launch a portable task, which is a really, really dumb Java application that just sleeps for, I think, a thousand seconds or something like that. We're actually gonna get that scheduled on both the Linux box and on the, uh, the Windows box. Um, so let's jump into that now. Live demos are always fun. Sometimes they fail, and um, then my nose bleeds. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so what I had, so okay, let me just set this up real quick. Oops, I didn't like that. Okay, everybody can see the font, maybe? So, as I mentioned, we've got Marathon up and running here. Here's a simple Mesos cluster, as I mentioned as well. Uh, there's just two agents running. There's a Windows agent with this beautiful host name and uh, a Linux agent, which is just reporting this host name. Um, and uh, this is running courtesy of Microsoft on the Azure cloud, so that's great. All right. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, show you the first, uh, whoops. I'm gonna go ahead and show you the first app I'm gonna run, which is this Windows app. So it's real simple, uh, it's running a .bat file. For simplicity in the demo, we just toss the, the .bat file in what's called the, the frameworks directory on the individual machines. Um, and you see this new constraint here, which is an OS-like Windows. So we're only gonna launch this on Windows, okay? So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna run the Windows app and see the background and you see, sure enough, we've got a task um, deployed here and the task gets scheduled. So fantastic, the task just launched. So now I'm gonna jump over to this, this Windows machine and what you can see is I've got some output from the slave down here. Um, you'll see that the, sorry, agent, I'm working on fixing it too. <laughs> We're gonna get through it together as a community, all right. Um, uh, you can also see that the executor has been launched um, and what I forgot to do, because I'm a bad demo giver, is I was supposed to come to this machine and show you that this page didn't refresh but now I'm gonna go ahead and refresh it here um, at least I think I am. I might have lost, uh, yeah, I might have lost connectivity just a second. Everyone should stop, like, going on the internet because I need this. <laughs> okay, let's, uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to, uh, Go back into the remote desktop here. All right. Okay. Now I think I can refresh. Okay. So I'm refreshing the, the web page now, so we'll actually see it hitting this, this uh, lo lo local, local task that we just launched. Um, it does take a little while, uh, the first time it loads. Um, it's booting up IS, okay. So, so here we go, so here's this app. So um, just to, to, to convince you all that this really is a Windows machine, not that you obviously don't know it's a Windows machine, um, we uh, do this little 404 where when we click it, you know, there's a non-existent link and sure enough it says, yep, this is IS web core and so yep, we're definitely on the Windows machine. Okay, so I've got this other little click here which is um, trying to go through some service discovery to find the Linux app and the first time I click it here, it says nothing. Okay, so now we're gonna go back and we're gonna launch um, the Linux app. So I'll just see what that looks like. So the Linux app is really simple. We're launching this a simple Docker web server, uh, which the, the, the Windows.net uh, app is able to communicate with. So I'll go ahead and uh, launch that. Okay, and um, we'll see Marathon sees it, gets it staged and deployed goes ahead and gets it launched. 
Now when I switch back and I refresh this page and I do the click, Hello Mesa's gone. All right, great. So now it's actually communicating. A Windows app is communicating with a Linux app. So that's awesome. Great. Wonderful. And now the last little fun part of the demo is I'm going to jump in here. I'm going to launch an app um, directly from... Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give each app basically 1.5 CPUs. The reason I'm going to give each app 1.5 CPUs is because that's going to force the scheduler to schedule one on a Linux box and one on the Windows box because otherwise I'm going to run out of resources. Um, and again, I want to launch two instances of this and the command SmesisCon Java. Again, we just we, we toss the command in, in the local machines, expedite, expedite the demo. So we have two task instances. Um, One's been staged and starts running. The next one's been staged and starts running. And uh, uh, sure enough, if I go here, you'll now see a Java process is running, which is great. And uh, going back here in Mesos, you'll see that we're running one MesosCon Java on that win agent hope, uh, host and another MesosCon Java on just this box, which was the Linux box. So that, that's, that concludes the demo. And um, let me just swap back here. I just have one more slide. It'll probably take like two minutes for it to come up. But basically, the slide says, enjoy MesosCon 2015. Uh, I hope everyone has a great time. There's a bunch of really, really great presentations I'm super excited about. Um, and uh, thanks to all our sponsors again. Thanks to all our speakers. Uh, thanks to Dave Lester for being the, the, the program chair of the conference. That's fantastic. And I hope to see as many of you as possible in Dublin. Uh, thanks so much.